I'd like to welcome you today to Spirit of Truth Fellowship. My name is Ed. I'd like to just uh, give warm greetings from Canada to our international viewers today and all those that come on YouTube. I just want to thank you for giving us some of your time today. I've been doing a series on loving life like Jesus loved life. This is my second in that series, and I'm talking about pressure that Jesus was under. So I'm going to be sharing my screen uh, with you today, and um, we'll just do that right now. So the series is Loving Life Like Jesus Love Life. And in part two, so what we're going to be talking about today, um, is dealing with pressure. And every one of us have different degrees of pressure. And Jesus was affected uh, with pressure right, right from birth. His, um, his parents had to flee because as a, as a child, he was, they were going to kill everyone under two. And and Mary and Joseph, of course, had that tension of their, their son is going to be crucified. And, I mean, later on, but they had the tension at that point that he, they would be killed. So Jesus lived under pressure. And that's what we're going to be talking about today um, and dealing with this pressure. And I'm trying to screen. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, dealing with pressure, um, part two. The pictures that I have that I'm going to be showing you are from the video I've chosen, and the scriptures I'm sharing with you are from the REV Bible, the Revised English Version, and it's just an excellent Bible. It's free. It's I just value it, especially the commentaries and the background information if you want more. So we're talking about um, Jesus under pressure, and he certainly had pressure. And, and we're, so that's what we talk about today. He dealt with pressure from his early childhood. I'm sure Mary and Joseph told him that he was not just an ordinary child. And right from the very beginning, he was told that his father was not Joseph, but his, his father was, was God. And so these expectations as he was growing up, even as a child from childhood, he was under pressure. Pressure that you and I were not under, but even his early childhood, he had pressure to conform, if you will, to his father's will, to be obedient, to be a son that there's expectations for him to do. But he did experience trauma, rejection, disappointment, abandonment, and every temptation that you and I had faced or will face. Now, one of the things I shared last week, one of the temptations that he did not have was to eat chocolate. <laughs> and that's a, a temptation that you could overeat. And we talked about that last week. So you want to know more about that? Um, check up my uh, teachings from the last time. Now, he lived his life under constant surveillance and judgment. And if you ever were on a job site and somebody's watching on you, and especially if it's your boss and you're you're doing a new job, if you will, or you're new at it, the, just the pressure of somebody watching you is, is stressful. Well, he was being watched all the time, both by those that were interested in what he had to say and those that were trying to find fault in what he said or when he did whatever he did. So his life was under constant surveillance and constant judgment. And then I would say under pressure that you and I haven't experienced. Now, one thing about Jesus, though, he had very few pressure points. Now, what I would suggest are pressure points are things that bug you. And if you were to think, well, this really bugs me when somebody says this or does that, this really bugs me. And I get really upset and I get really angry. We find that Jesus had very few pressure points. And like you or me, um, Jesus did not have things that you could just push and make him lose his temper or sin. For 40 days, he was tempted by the enemy of God to see, is there a way to get at him? Is there a way to get at him? Is there a way to get at him? And I have uh, friends that I, my, some of my hockey friends, and this one fellow in particular, um, he has an uncle who's a pastor, and and his impression of Christianity from his uncle is not very good. And so he says and does things to try to get me to get angry or be upset, and um, and I don't. <laughs> One of the reasons I realize that's what he wants to do. And Jesus many times was under pressure, and they actually the scripture says they were looking for. Watching him in ways of accusing him. So if he healed on the Sabbath, they'd say, "Why are you healing on the Sabbath? There's, you know, six other days you can heal." 
And then Jesus dealt with that. So he wasn't frustrated. And so there were very, very few things that Jesus had any buttons that they could push that would tempt him to lose his temper and to sin. The scripture says he was tempted in all parts like us, but he was without sin. And one of the reasons that I, I feel that he this kept him is he always wanted to be in right relationship with his father. That was his highest priority, to be in right relationship with his father. And if you think of, if like I'm married, and if I want to be in right relationship with my wife, then I'm not going to do things that are they're going to break that relationship. And Jesus said the two greatest commandments is to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. So if we if we value being in right relationship with God, that in itself will help us deal with any external pressures that come that may would tempt us like anybody else to sin. And Jesus always always wanted to be in right relationship with his Father to a point where the Father said, "This is my beloved Son." whom I'm well pleased. And of course, all of us would want to hear that always from anybody that are really pleased. Thank you for what you're doing. And those kind of words bless us. And so Jesus valued that. And I believe that was the basis for the way he responded to what he did and how he acted because he was doing all the time his father's will. And yet he was still under pressure. So I'm um, four. We're going to look at this. It says, but know that Yahweh, that's the name of God, has set apart the godly person for himself. So here we see this godly person, Jesus, or you, as an example. Yahweh will hear when I call to him. And so Jesus knew that he could be in communication with the Father and that he was set apart and, as, and that he knew that. And because of that, he had that relationship. And then as far as being angry, the scriptures say, be angry, but sin not. But here we can say, you can be angry. Now, anger is an emotion. It's a, it's a feeling. But how you respond to whatever comes is different, like being in a mood or a state of being anger compared to something is bothering you. But do not sin. Speak in your heart on your bed and keep silent, Selah. And that Selah means Consider this, think about it, give it some time, meditate on it. Now, I'd like to just share what, what I believe this means, speak in your heart on your bed. Um, my wife and I, not every night or all the time, but quite often we go over our day and say, so what was the best thing that you liked during the day? What was the best thing? Was there anything that happened that during the day that you wish hadn't happened? And by doing that, we can... If there was anything, anything between the two of us, we can work it out. The scripture says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So what does that mean? That means before you go to bed, if there are things that happen to you that you haven't resolved, then think about it. Have it in your heart. Talk to God about it. That keeping silent means listen to what God is saying. And then the last part of that verse five says, sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness. So is this the right thing to do? So you might have to make sacrifices to do that. And Jesus, of course, was a living sacrifice. And he tells us to present our bodies, that would mean everything, as living sacrifices. And so there are times where we have to just step out of the ordinary and into the spiritual direction of God's spirit in us. And one thing that's really helped me over, over time not to be angry at how people respond is this. I think a dog wags his tail. Now, why does a dog wag his tail? Because it's a dog. Whether it's a male dog or a female dog, they wag their tails as dogs. And so people who are people, they offend people because they're people. That just happens. So people offend people because they are people. And it's not likely that you're going to be in any group where somebody doesn't say or do or something that might be offensive to somebody else. So that really helps me to realize that all of us, including me, I'm a person, I could say or do something either intentionally or unintentionally that could be offensive to somebody else. And so even Christians are people. And so sometimes I think, well, you, he's a Christian, you shouldn't do or say that. But no, all of us are growing. All of us need transformation. All of us need our mind renewed, and all of us are at different stages of our spiritual growth. 
So just because somebody's a Christian doesn't mean they should be acting like a Christian. They're acting like a person and Christians are people too. So this really helps me if somebody does something and think, well, they're a person, people do that. I'm going to love them anyway. Jesus talked about love your enemies. And we talked about turn your cheek. <laughs> but And so often uh, I was told in the back, that means, well, if he hits you on one side, let him hit you the other side. That's abusive. The greeting that people in, in the Jewish times where Jesus lived, one of the ways they greeted was with a holy kiss. So they would kiss on one side of the cheek and turn the other side of the cheek. That was showing love. And I think that scripture, turn the cheek, doesn't mean get beat up. It means show love. So if a person does something to you, love your enemies. So instead of responding with anger or um, some type of way of showing you're, you're upset, then show love. So turn to me, turning your cheek, I mean, just what it means, what they would understand it means, turn one way or turn the other way. So Christians are people. And that really helps me because I want to understand myself and understand the, the nature of people. Now, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. He knew what was in his own heart. And he knew what what would have um, maybe broken his heart or what whatever was happening. Um, my friend, uh, who's, who is uh, a Baptist, and we were in his swimming pool, and we were talking, every spiritual talk, we were talking about what, what's natural, what's in the heart of people. And then he asked me, he said, Ed, if and we're in the swimming pool, the two of us, he said, if a naked woman started walking around the pool, what would you do? And I, I didn't say, oh, I would close my eyes and I would look down and I would pray something. I didn't say that. I said, I'd look. And then he said, oh, good, because that's a natural thing to do. Now, what you do with it after, it, it makes a big difference. So Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. And my friend Peter, when he said that, he knew it was in the heart of man. Jesus knew what was in his heart and he knew what was in other people's heart. And so what Jesus was into, not in revenge or retribution or ways of responding in a negative way, but he was in the, the restoration of relationships. He came to draw people back to God, to undo false teachings and ways of people relating to one another. So he was the main thing that Jesus was. I want to be in right relationship with God, and I'm going to do my best to help you be in right relationship with God. So you can live a happy and abundant life as best as possible on this earth. Then, and then in the future, that you would be in right relationship with God for eternity because of what, what you did with God and with Jesus on the earth. So that's what he was all about. Restoration in relationships, not revenge, not retribution. Those are natural ways of responding. So forgiving is the foundation for restoration. You can't restore you can't be in right, right relationship with somebody if you're not willing to forgive and if you're already forgiven in your heart. So that's the beginning. We see that uh, Jesus gave Peter the opportunity to renew the relationships in his loyalty and his love three different times because we know that, that Peter denied Jesus three different times when, when he really, and that was a prophecy. So Jesus understood the fallen nature of man. Even though Peter um, claimed his loyalty, he denied knowing Jesus. And, and in Matthew, you can read this uh, later, Matthew 26, verses 33 to 35, Peter, along with others, um, said to Jesus, even if I die with you, I will never, I will never, um, I will never deny you. And the other disciples uh, did exactly the same thing. Now, of course, what what we, what we found happening, the rooster crowed three times, and Jesus, what he prophesied, what he told them, um, came true. And and now Peter was in a, well, what have I done? And the other disciples also um, said they wouldn't deny Jesus, although Peter was there. So Jesus understood the nature of man. And Jesus knew in his own heart what his nature was. Of, of he's, he's going to be tempted. He knew that. He was a human being like you and I. The Bible says that. But he wanted to guard it 
from sin. That's what Jesus wanted. And he wants us to do the same thing. So he was tempted to respond in negative ways, just like you and I are, but he didn't respond that way. He had a thought. That's what a temptation is. And temptation itself is not a sin. It's just something that comes. It may be, it may be a temptation that you instigated. It may be a temptation from somebody else. It may be a temptation from the enemy of God. And of course, he was tempted, the scripture says, by Satan for 40 days. But he also was tempted throughout his life. And he understood, I could respond this way. I'm not going to do that. And the same thing with us, that whatever happens, we can be tempted. We don't have to respond that way. What Jesus valued most was relationship, more than his personal pride, more than anything else. He valued right relationship with his father all the time. And that's what I want to do. I want to be in right relationship with God. I want to be in right relationship with my wife and my family. And I want to be in right relationship with those that are still outside the kingdom of God. And if I can live like that, I'm not going to be an offense to somebody else unless they choose that. Now, I realize that the scripture says, as much as possible with you, be at peace with all men. So I can't control it, but I don't want to be one that gives offense in any way, say, well, nobody's perfect, so I can say or do this. And I'm going to list uh, some potential offenses that may have happened to you or to, that happens to me. And, um, and, the, and this is not obviously the, the full spectrum of it. First of all, you're completely innocent and you haven't done anything wrong. I remember, uh, remember for me, the the first time this happened, I was um, maybe in grade six, maybe grade seven, grade six. And it was the winter time. And my best friend, Jim, who lived nearby, it was in the winter time. Um, we were going out of, out of the school and they had these metal grates on the floor. And what you do is you come in and you'd wipe your feet on these grates and the, the dirt or the mud or whatever would fall on the grates. And then the a caretaker would take them and smash it like this. And all the thing would fall. He'd clean up and then he'd put it back down. So that metal grate, it was little, little squares of metal that would that was hinged together. You need to know that. So anyway, I'm, I'm leaving lunch and we're going down the stairs and Jimmy's hiding on the other side of the stairwell. And then he jumped on me. Yeah, hey, yeah. And he jumped on me like this. And I rolled over. And I, when I rolled over, I knelt on his hand, which is over the grate. And then he screamed. Now, the teacher, the, the lunchroom teacher, was at the top of the stairs. And Jimmy's screaming. We're just rolling, tumbling. He's my best friend. And somebody said, Ed bit him. The, the, a girl screamed that out. And then the teacher said, stop it, you two. Come here. And looked at Jim's hand, and here are these marks on the back of his hand. This girl is saying he Ed bit him, and um, he, the, it wasn't cut or anything, but it was obviously red marks. Told Jim to go to the washroom and put cold water on it. And you got my back in my office. I mean, back in my classroom. So she said, "Why did you bite him?" And I, I never bit anybody in my life, but I still haven't bit anybody in my life. And she says, why did you bite him? And I said, I didn't bite him. Don't you lie to me. You bit him. I saw it. And I said, I didn't bite him. And she said, if you, do, if you lie to me, you're going to get the strap. And so okay, now what do I do? Like, do I lie to get out of this? I'm, I'm innocent. So I said, I didn't bite him. And for the rest, maybe 20 minutes, she did this. She strapped me. And then I think this lady's crazy. So she's going to strap me for the next 40 minutes and my hands are really sore and everything. So then I said, yes, I bit him. And she says, well, you should have said that in the first place. And I said, but I didn't bite him. And then she strapped me again. I think, oh, this is the craziest thing. I'm getting, I'm getting strapped nonstop for something which I didn't do. And I'm telling the truth and I'm getting, because <laughs> it was the line. So finally I said, I bit him. He says, why did you say that first place? Because I thought I would get in trouble. Well, you got in trouble. Now go. So I remember going outside, putting my hands in the snow just to cool them off. And then the, the rectory, the church, the school I went to was a Catholic school. And the rectory was right close to the school. So I knocked on the door of the, of the the where the priest lived, the rectory. And I explained to him what happened. So this is what he said. <laughs> I never forgot this. He said, Ed... You yes, you're innocent, but Jesus was also innocent, 
and he suffered way more than you. So just accept this, that you suffered for being innocent like Jesus did. Now, do you think that made me feel really good? Not at all. Thinking, ah, no, no, you know, somebody should talk to that teacher. I never did him. But that's, and I never told my parents either because then I'd get more trouble at home. But he, that was the first time where where I, I felt I was innocent and I was punished for a good 20 minutes. And now, of course, as an as an adult, I mean, it, it makes a whole, whole difference than, than um, what, what, we're, what we're going through. So I go back to sharing now. So, so you may relate to some of these things. Um, so, and I'm just going to go through the next series of potential offenses that that could that could happen to you or could happen to me. So the next one is you've been maligned. That people have said things about you that aren't true. You've been rejected. It could be a, about a job or it could be a date that you wanted to go on and person didn't want to have anything to do with you, but just the feeling of rejection, or you've been mocked, that people made fun of you, they laughed at you, you know how that feels, or your rights have been violated. It could be something simple uh, as somebody cuts you off while you're driving, you're really mad at that person, and you, lo you, you lose it, and then there, you've heard of road rage, sometimes when somebody does that, it may lead to an accident or even worse, but that's a, a potential offense. Or loved ones has been hurt. No, that that one it, it, you should have compassion. But if you take offense and be upset because a loved one has been hurt, that those two people maybe worked it out, but you're still offended. And of course, the person that's offended your loved one is not going to come to you and say, "Hey, listen, Ed, would you forgive me for doing this something to your friend?" So it's really important that we don't take up an offense of somebody else. We certainly can be compassionate. We can be understanding, we can listen, but being offended and taking up an offense and being upset. And also you're only hearing one side of the story just as that, as that goes true. The things don't go quite as you expected. How many have had that happen? You expected a good time and it ended up being a family argument or whatever. And then your heart's been broken. It, I mean, it could be all different ways, but all of these are potential offenses that you can deal with because all of them are outside and how you respond is our responsibility. What happens is not necessarily responsible unless we are causing it. But if all these things are outside, so we want to look at Jesus now. First of all, he was completely innocent. And, and he said, look, if there's anything I said or did, just tell me about it. But if you don't, then at least look what I'm doing. And is that good or not good? So Jesus was completely innocent, never did anything wrong. He was maligned. He was rejected, not, not only by people, but you know, his own disciples, his own family, that his brothers thought he was crazy, and uh, his own disciples rejected him, except for a few. And he was mocked. He was violated. He, his loved one was beheaded, John the Baptist. And like, why did God allow that to happen? And even John the Baptist re was not sure of, is Jesus really the Messiah after all that he did? And even his disciples, the scripture says, even after the 5,000 were, were fed, they still were not positive that he was the Messiah. That itself has got to be hurtful. You do all these things and people still don't accept you. But Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. And so when men acted like men or women acted like women, he understood that. But there's still hurt when people do that to all of us. And then he was broken, not only physically broken, but in, in his spirit, he was broken. And, um, and But he never sinned. And we'll talk more about that. So how did Jesus respond? Well, the basis of his response was, what I'm going to do, will that bring people closer to God? Will that bring people closer to me? Will that bring our relationship right? Or will do the opposite? So what, what was the one of the last things that Jesus said when he was crucified? He said, Father, forgive them for what? They don't know what they're doing. They don't get it. They don't understand it. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. So how did Jesus respond when he was completely innocent? What he did, Jesus, what he what he Jesus did, he just, just ignored it. He ignored every single thing that he was rejected, he he being mocked 
being violated, his when he was be his John the Baptist was beheaded. He knew it was a hard man, even though he's broken. Jesus related by Father, forgive them. And so this is something that is really important to me that I don't take up an offense and I don't get I don't get offended if I can help it. And and then I don't have to worry about forgiving people because I'm not going to be offended. I understand where they're at. Now, for, for me, what I try to do is understand why I'm reacting the way I'm reacting. Knowing our triggers can stop a potential problem. So what do we mean by that? Well, there are things, if you know, in a, in a gun example, you know what that trigger is and, and it could cause damage. If you know what sets you off, what what there's there's an area of your life that sets you off. Now, yesterday I was working in the garden and I normally I wear gloves and I work with wood and I got a, a splinter in my hand. Now, it wasn't really bad. And it's it actually this morning when I finally got it out. But here's here's a problem. Or say you have a pebble in your shoe and you're walking around your shoe. Now it hurts. Every step you take, you, you, it hurts you. So you can respond in different ways. The most important thing is to find out the cause of the problem. Oh, I got a splinter in my hand. I've got a pebble in my shoe. So I'm going to take care of it. Or you can just live with it and say, oh, it's just a little splinter. It's not that bad. People will suffer worse things. I'm just going to leave it. And of course, every time I touch it, it hurts. Or if I shake somebody's hands, it hurts. If I grab something, it hurts. So leaving a painful thing is not a good answer. And then the other part is, well, I'm just going to live with this. And but now I can't I can't walk. It hurts. So when somebody says, hey, Ed, you want to play this game? And I know I know. Thank you. Hey, Ed, you want to come to my house? No, I can't. You know, so by not dealing with it, it may prevent you from doing other things and you still have the pain. So understanding past hurts that have not been resolved may be the problem. And so it's so, so important that we, we be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And why is our mind being affected, which causes pain, is, is the key. The way we respond to others and to different situations may reflect our present heart condition. And this is the transformation that takes place. Scripture says, Jesus said, it's not with, from without that's important. It's what's within. And so if our heart is right, then, then we need to deal with that. If our heart is broken or we have pain in our heart, then we need to deal with that too. Now, when Jesus was uh, deeply grieved, if you, if you read that in Matthew 26 um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, who did he appeal to first? He appealed to his disciples. First, come with me. I'm really grieved. I, I need you to be with me. And so when, when uh, there's a trauma or something you're going through, if you have somebody in fellowship that you could talk to and say, hey, listen, this is what's happening to me. Can you can you help me with this? Can you work with it, with me with this? And not not trying to get the other person mad at the other person, but this is this is what I'm going through. And that's what Jesus asked. And of course, they all fell asleep. And then he asked them again and again. And then he appealed to his father. And, and then, he, then he was revealing his heart, his heart condition. Is there another way? Is there another way? Is there another way? Three times he played with the father. And then he came to the resolve. Okay, this is not, we're not going to change this. Not my will, but yours be done. Now, we don't know what Jesus' will was, but we know that he had a heart condition that he didn't want to really go through what, what was to be expected. So we too can ask God for help to identify any unresolved, issues in our heart and so he was deeply grieved this this was not just uh, some shallow splinter this was something that was deeply grieved so he was dealing with emotions that were flooding him. the scripture says even like sweat drops of blood and it was maybe his sweat was so thick it was like that or maybe it was actually blood that was that he was sweating but he he had this deep, deep emotion that caused physical pain that was outwardly ex was shown. And that sorrow was great. And he was saying, this is, you can hardly bear this. But why did he do it? Because he wanted to be in right relationship with the Father. And because of that, he then he resolved to do God's will. So being offended is something that we can control. 
we we can control we can't do what others we can't control others but we can at least choose how we can respond and we can choose not to be offended and give up our happiness or we can choose to to be offended so our choice on how we re react is our choice in our first response to so anyone who thinks differently than us is likely to feel threatened so now say somebody says something to me that's different than what i believe the first thing we, we want whoa what well i don't believe what you just said whatever it is it could be negative or it could be a truth or something else the person is presenting to us so our first response is we feel threatened now if we feel threatened then our security is threatened and then our pride may be threatened if somebody is saying something but they're not trying to make us feel dumb we might just assume that so that might be hey i'm kind of insecure about this you're you're exposing my insecurity so now i'm upset with you because you're making me look bad so we may interpret that narrative as someone's expressing something that causes to feel negative about ourselves, where the person may not be doing that at all and of course that's where pride comes in and pride challenges often challenges us to express anger or withdrawal you get mad at the person break break the relationships or you withdraw and say I'm, I'm not going to, don't talk to me more about that, but the hurt is still there. So we can choose our reaction. It's perfectly normal when something is different, our first reaction is be defensive. But after that, if we're allowed to think, is the is what is the, per, is this person trying to hurt me, harm me, or, or is the person trying to just share where they're at? And, and one way of responding is saying, hey, I never thought of that. Tell me more rather than saying you're attacking me because you're telling me something that's different. So it's it's perfectly normal. But then if our reaction is like Jesus, I want to build relationship with people. Relationship building is the most important, not breaking relationships, but being in relationship is the most important. Jesus came for sinners to bring truth to sinners. And so I'm a sinner. And if somebody wants to bring truth to me through another person or reading scriptures say hey this is how i understand scriptures i want to know that i'm a truth seeker and if somebody's presenting the truth then i'm open to truth but if they wait a second whatever you're saying is different than what i believe i don't want to hear it from you anymore or you get you're upsetting me don't talk anymore about that all those things the enemy of god would want us to do not hear what jesus said sila listen stop listen consider we read in the Psalms. So those that are, are overtly testing Jesus, he understood that. He knew it was in the heart of man and he remained calm. And at times he didn't respond. He was silent before Pilate and, and other people. Now just if for me, I, I say dogs wag their tail because they're dogs. So I want to check the, the motive behind the comment, both mine and the person who I'm in conversation. Philippians 2 and... Uh, Chapter two says, do nothing out of selfish ambition, but of conceit or out of conceit, but in humility, value others above yourself. Maybe I can learn from somebody. Each of you should not look not only, only for his own interests, but that's important, but also the interests of others. Like, tell me why you think that way. How, how long have you thought that? And so now you're entering a conversation without putting the other person down or even having to defend yourself. I ask myself, did this conversation that I have bring us closer together and closer to Jesus or did it have a, a possible negative effects? And so what I want to do is are, are a few things. One, cause others, I don't want to do this rather, I want to avoid this, cause others to join in, in my offense. So that's gossip. Take up someone else's offense. I shared that earlier. Um, think time will restore relationships it doesn't if the relationship is faltering the sooner that you restore the relationship the better downplay the offense oh I, that's that's not that important but it is just like the a small splinter is and then deal with it later so what are my takeaways first of all i'm responsible for my response not what happens but my response i can choose not to be offended i can eliminate as many triggers as possible each night, I could say, okay, why was I upset about that? Before I go to bed, do not let the sun go down. Your wrath is a way of cleansing yourself, going over the day, and then asking God, why, why was I upset about that? 
and help me with that. Be for my mind to be transformed. And at nighttime, you went over your day and say, "Wow, I, I got upset about that. I don't want to do that again. Why?" And then bitterness can be avoided, and of course, it's not healthy. And building relationships to me is a high priority. What I say and do: love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies. <laughs> and so this is what I want to do. This is how I want to live. And so when pressures come, that's what I want to do. Now I'm going to be teaching in. Uh, the need for relationships so so important, and how it can be used and abused. How to deal with open conversations and keep conversations going, about sharing the truth of and, and how to do it in ways that's not offensive, and then accepting people where they're at and and bringing them along, and also being more like Jesus. So these are the things that I'll be talking about in, in future sessions, and I just like to pray for you and for me as we just conclude this. And again, I want to thank you for being part of. Spirit and Truth Fellowship, and, and hopefully that uh, what I've shared to do today will have an impact on you in your relationships with others and relationship with Jesus and relationship with our Father. So Lord, I, I thank you for all that you're doing in us. And my prayer is that we will be like Jesus and love life like Jesus love, love people like Jesus love, and then love ourselves the way we should to be a reflection of who you are. So I would say, come Lord Jesus, Touch my heart, if, if as David prayed, creating me a new heart. If there be anything in me, share that with me so I could be more like your son. I pray this in Jesus' name. Thanks for coming, and God bless you today.